some micro robots that need ML. Uh, the speaker is um, uh, Chris Pister, and uh, Chris um, uh, is a um, uh, was a um, uh, professor of um, UCLA, and then he uh, moved to the uh, uh, UC Berkeley uh, since uh, 1996, and. Uh, uh, in 2003 and 2004, he was on, on the leave from UC Berkeley as a CEO and a CTO of Dust Networks, a company he founded to commercialize wireless um, uh, sensor networks. He participated in the uh, creation of several wireless uh, sensor networking uh, standards, including wireless um, heart, IEEE 802.15.4E, ISA 111A and IETF 60 ISH. He has part, uh, participated in many government uh, science and uh, technology programs, including DARPA, ISET, and uh, Defense Science Study Group, and is currently a member of um, Jason. Okay, Chris? Thank you. That list of standards is enough to put me asleep. All right, I am a microelectromechanical systems guy. I have been trying to make autonomous micro robots ever since I was a grad student at Berkeley uh, some three decades ago. And uh, so I'll tell you about some of the robot platforms we're making progress on, um, and then a little bit about machine learning. I am not really a machine learning person, but in academia these days, you can't do anything without having your students asking you if they can apply machine learning to it somehow. So I'm sort of slowly being tugged into that uh, area by my grad students. So we, uh, we etch motors and mechanisms into silicon. Uh, so what you're looking at there is about a square millimeter of silicon. There's a layer on top that's 40 microns thick, about the thickness of a, a sheet of heavy duty aluminum foil. And when you apply uh, 50 to 100 volts onto the variable capacitors in there, um, they push on this, these little rods, which push that central shuttle. And the central shuttle then ex extends those springs that you can see kind of getting bigger as it goes over the, to the side. So those motors are pretty good. They've got a force density and a power density that's on the order of uh, insect flight muscle, which is about as good as it gets in the, in the biological world. And they're, they're quite efficient. So it turns out, in addition to the motors, we can also make mechanisms. And that lets us attempt to make uh, hexapods, as an example. So you can see uh, on this little guy, maybe I can see, maybe I can't. Well, we can see six legs on there. So there's right, six legs. Each leg has two motors on it and a couple of mechanisms. And when we get these guys going with external power on all of these, you can see the little motors running and pushing the legs and it not really walking. So that is uh, about as far as we've gotten. But we're very, we're very close after only 30 years of <laughs> effort <laughs> on this. So you can see it is really trying hard to take steps and move uh, on the order of a millimeter every 30 seconds. But progress, progress is being made. So that's the, the walkers. We can put electronics on them, it turns out. So a microprocessor, I'll show you a much smaller version of this, uh, high voltage buffers and so on uh, in a minute. Um, and you can imagine batteries and solar cells as well, making this thing autonomous. Uh, if walking is not what you're looking for, then we can jump, or at least uh, jump with external power. You can see the wires on there, and you may be able to see the little motors uh, kind of ratcheting their way down, slowly extending the spring in the middle of it. And if we waited long enough, we'd see this thing take a, a little jump. Uh, here's one where we cheated a little bit and loaded it manually, but it actually jumped its own, its own height. So that was, a, that was a big step in the right direction. Um, and this one, the, the latest one, Craig is working on actually loading up springs that are etched into the silicon substrate itself. So now you're not looking at a 40 micron film, you're looking at something that's a little over a half millimeter. So we've etched the entire chip out from underneath there, and the springs that you see are actually etched into the substrate. And that guy should be able to jump uh, more than a meter uh, when it works. It doesn't, doesn't work yet. And I told Craig he gets his dissertation signed when it jumps onto his dissertation on my desk. <laughs> so he went and bought a little Barbie desk, and that's where he's shooting for right, right now. So 
you can see that's a, a picture of the, that 40 micron layer on there. Whoops. Why did that not work? Well, we don't seem to be able to see the motors. Oh, there we go. Well, all right. Anyway, little motors moving, and it's actually just uh, deflecting the substrate springs, or we're crushing the silicon chip with our little motors. So, jumping doesn't get you. Then, how about flying? So, we uh, uh, Daniel Drew was working on electrohydrodynamic thrust. So, the idea is we've got a little corona discharge wire that on on the upper left-hand corner, and that was our first flight with 7,000 volts um, on it. We did get. We did get a little bit better. Um, so this is now four uh, corona discharge wires over four grids and, and lower voltage. So now we've got a quadcopter. This is all of them running simultaneously. Uh, and the thing takes off. It's really spooky. No moving parts. It's silent uh, and uh, takes off. If you only energize two of them, that gives you a rolling moment. And so it rolls over before it blows up. Um, and then we actually, again, with external power, Put a micro, uh, not a microprocessor, sorry, put uh, an InventSense uh, nine axis inertial measurement unit on there and with an external microprocessor, wrap a feedback control loop around that and we can actually stabilize the roll and pitch axis by uh, playing with the high voltage. We're, da we're down to 1700 volts uh, now ionizing the air on these things. We get about four meters per second of, of airflow through this ion engine with, with no moving parts. Uh, and this may not look very stable to you, but that is <laughs> way better than it, than it used to be before wrapping the control loop around it. So, and the numbers work out that if, if we really do everything right, we ought to be able to fly for five minutes with batteries that we can carry with this thing if you give me you know, $5 million in three years in a DARPA program to do it. <laughs> um, so if ionocraft are hard, uh, just put a rocket motor in it and use the MEMS uh, as control surfaces. So what you're seeing there is basically a toy Estes rocket, but it's got a microprocessor and a radio and an inertial measurement unit. And then this little MEMS fin on the front. Uh, this is a little closer to the size scale that we're shooting for. Um, we, again, have this, these electrostatic inchworm motors uh, that are etched into the substrate and then a, a silicon fin put onto it. Here's a picture of that in a, a wind tunnel that my student built so with 50 mile an hour airflow going over it. The, the motor is able to move it. And uh, then mounted on a rocket in a wind tunnel, we actually have, you know, we can show you things rotating uh, as we actuate the, the fin and so on. So we still haven't launched it, but, you know, soon hopefully we'll be able to have our own uh, little guided missiles. And the goal is to take the ion thrusters and make a little aircraft and take the rockets and miniaturize them down so they're the size of a cigarette, maybe something like that. And I'd really love to be able to shoot down quadcopters. That's my, my goal is to fly a dental floss through the rotors of quadcopters and knock them out of the sky. So when you get lots and lots of little robots, they want to be able to talk to each other. Uh, so a couple of standards you might use, 802.15.4, I've had a lot to do with uh, in my smart dust company, um, and Bluetooth. Um, the problem is those are, these aren't the absolute smallest boards that you can make, but they're, they're pretty close. And, and to scale, roughly, that's the size of the robot that I'm trying to make. So that's a painful thing for the robot to carry around. So I spent the last six years of my life trying to build something that had that same functionality where you just put a battery on there, power and ground, and it lets you do communication. And we finally have got that working. It's a single chip micromote or SCUM. Uh, and that little guy, if you give it power and ground, uh, will speak 802.15.4 to off-the-shelf silicon uh, and BLE to commercial, to, to your cell phone um, with no external components, no crystals, no caps, no balance, no nothing. It just needs power and ground. And with a wire bond antenna across it, it will go three meters to your cell phone. So nobody's been able to do that before. That was a lot of fun. So now I can put that onto my robots and they should be able to form mesh networks. We chose 15.4 because that's where I've got a lot of experience building mesh networks. If you uh, drive around in San Francisco, you'll, you'll be able to actually look on your cell phone and see where the open parking spaces are. That's a, a network of 10,000 parking sensors uh, that are embedded in the pavement now, not on the surface like that. Um, and that all, you can see the actual connectivity of the mesh network uh, that we've got there of these guys multi-hopping their messages around. That is exactly the same protocol that my little robots should be able to build. So we should be able to deploy thousands of little robots around a city and have them form a mesh network. And then I will, you know, I will rule the world. No idea why, I just, I'm just sort of captivated by the idea. Um, so there's a, a picture of the single chip micromote next to a little 3x3 millimeter chip that was uh, designed by Jason Stouth in a collaboration 
uh, with Berkeley and DARPA. And that thing has 200 solar cells on it. So I can not only power the microprocessor and the radio on the, on the SCUM chip, uh, but also power the GPIO ring, and in fact, power the 100 volt buffers that let me run the electrostatic inchworm motors, and all, all with solar power run those motors. So we've got the, the power, we've also got uh, uh, magnetic scavenging, we've shown that we can run the, everything off of a five millimeter by five millimeter lithium battery, so we've got all the pieces there. On the sensor side, off the shelf, you can buy very low power, very small, lightweight microphones, um, you can even get these beautiful LiDARs uh, from ST Micro, uh, amazing uh, devices. Um, you can buy little, little cameras, but not little enough, really. I'm trying to make a two cubic millimeter camera with about a tenth of a megapixel and a bunch of onboard processing. Um, so we can take an image for something like a microjoule, uh, and then the question is, how many microjoules do I have to spend in order to do something useful with that image? And that's obviously what this community is really good at doing. Um, some of the fun things to do there uh, are making diffuser cams, so you don't, you don't have a lens, you actually make a, a diffuser and you get these weird patterns like you see on the bottom of a swimming pool in, in summer, uh, they're called caustics that encode the information, perfect for neural net kinds of things. And then if we stick a dif diffraction grating in front of that, now we should be able to do hyperspectral imaging for cheap in a tiny package like this. And that's something I don't think I've heard anybody talk about in the neural network world, and I feel like that's a that's, that's something that has, has potentially can be a, a, a game changer or it might be a totally terrible idea. I don't know, we'll, we'll find out. So, and the, to scale, that's uh, the microphone, LiDAR, and camera, and, and a little robot. So we can carry this size um, thing. So we've kind of got all the tools now. So now what do you do with them? And I'm not gonna say much about machine learning. I'm not, I don't know much about it. Um, but insects are a source of, of a lot of motivation. You know, a, a honeybee has a million neurons and maybe a billion weights, a billion synapses in between them. Um, and they, they're just staggering the kinds of, of capabilities that a, that a honeybee has to do that. But the nice thing about working at this scale is you're not controlling a $100,000 Tesla, right? You're controlling something that's cheap. And so if it makes mistakes, you know, they're not perfect, <laughs> right? They're, they're incredible, incredible systems, but they do make mistakes every now and then. And that's okay at this size scale, right? We will crunch all you want, we'll make more. So we have done some fun things. I had the good fortune to uh, get hooked up with Sergey Levin and Roberto Calandra, who was postdocing with Sergey at the time and now at Facebook. Uh, and they really, you know, are the ones that were advising the students on all this stuff. So we showed that we could uh, optimize controllers for these hexapods and, you know, teach them how to maximize their speed at, at certain uh, angles and then show that that actually generalized to climbing at multiple angles and do some, some path planning as well. Um, and then, well, what if we turn evolution loose and, and do a little bit of evolution of the structure of the robot at the same time that we're evolving the controller and you can show that you can do even better than, than, uh, than you could before, so that was a, that was a fun one. Um, and then, you know, kind of ab initio, try to learn how to control a quadcopter, give it nothing but, but uh, just let it go and, and apply random signals and, and learn from that. And the amazing thing is that after only, uh, in the, sort of the final version of what we did, after only two minutes of flight, uh, the thing has learned well enough that it can actually fly for five seconds, which you know, may or may not be impressive to you, uh, depending upon your, your background. But we were very, very happy uh, when this thing didn't just flip over and crash like it did for many, many uh, iterations before. So, so you, you, can, you can learn, and there, I think there are real opportunities in micro-robots for learning, and it's got to be tiny, right? We, our radio burns a milliwatt, and we don't turn it on very often. It's got to be off 99% of the time. We're talking about micro-watt kinds of budgets. So uh, you know, I've, I saw one poster over here that was talking about microjoules per inference. Love that. It's in the, you know, a couple orders of magnitude more than I can afford, but at least it's, uh, it's talking about microjoules, which is cool. Um, so that's the kind of thing that we can afford on this size platform. Uh, and you know, that's what I'm, I've got a student, a master's student, who's just getting started and trying to figure out, you know, can we recognize things that a micro robot want, might, might want to recognize uh, from the CIFAR 10 uh, uh, database and do it with less than a million multiply accumulates and less than a megabit worth of uh, storage. And you know, yeah, maybe. It looks like maybe we'll, we'll get there. So summary, uh, all the hardware pieces are in place. The systems are starting to come together to make autonomous micro robots, to make you know, uh, 
silicon robots. Uh, and it does seem that uh, machine learning may be kind of the key piece that, we're, uh, that will enable us to actually get these things to be useful and, and uh, do interesting applications. So thank you very much.